Hello, my name's Tony Hart of Hart Racing. The video we've produced for you illustrates a full service and what it would involve. It also contains some tips on troubleshooting and locating problem areas. The first area we're going to look at is oil and water leaks. Check the hoses for their condition, also the hose clips. Check the radiator. Have a look at the end tanks. They normally leak down the side where the end tanks join the main core. Also have a look in the centre of the V, see if there's any obvious oil or water leaks there. And also the back of the cam covers. Just run your finger down the back there and see if there's any obvious oil. From underneath the car, you can check for oil leaks around the back of the engine. Also drips from the cam covers will come down the side of the engine and end up on the starter motor on this side. Then over here, on the oil pump and transfer housing. Also check around the sump area around the front here to make sure there's no leaks there. If we have a look at this engine on the engine stand, we can see more clearly the oil pump and the oil transfer housing. Check these areas carefully. They're sealed with O-rings, rather like that. Now over a period of time, those O-rings go brittle and stop doing their job and end up like that, breaking up very easily and pouring with oil. Next thing to check here, have a look at the oil pump. It's quite often people are putting Saab oil pumps in these days, which do give too high an oil pressure, can shorten the life of the chains and cause all sorts of damage to the engine. Easy way to check whether yours is a Saab or a standard pump is have a look at the pressure relief valve housing. It should have the words Holbenetan across it. If it hasn't, if it's plain like this one, that's the Saab pump. Next item you'll need to check is the distributor and HT leads. Have a look at the HT leads, make sure they're not starting to crack up or perish. If we again go and have a look at the engine on the test stand, remove the distributor cap and have a look inside the cap. Check the contacts there, make sure they're not corroded away. Have a look around for the general condition of the cap to make sure there's no cracks or anything in it. Then there's a couple of checks inside the distributor we need to make. First thing to check here is the mechanical advance. You can check this very simply by just moving the rotor arm across. should spring back. If it doesn't, the mechanical advance is seized and you're going to have to strip the distributor. Next thing to check is the vacuum advance. If you suck on the, the vacuum pipe like this, you'll see the base plates move across. If they do, everything's OK. As you can see, this distributor's on electronic ignition, which makes life very easy, very little maintenance at all. If we now take this out and have a look at this distributor, which is on the standard point setup, and in a very sorry state, first of all, have a look at the base plates themselves. These ones, you can see, flopping around all over the place. Clearly, they're going to have to be changed. Check the points, make sure they're OK. If they need replacing, the best way to set those up, after you've set them up with a feeler gauge at 15 thou, try and get hold of a dwell meter. It can be bought very cheaply now from most accessory shops and cover a wide variety of, of uses as well as checking dwell. But once you've checked the dwell, you can be sure that the, that distributor is now set up as it should be. The final thing to check on the distributor is the centre shaft. Give it a wiggle from side to side, see if there's any appreciable play in it. If there is, you'll never be able to set the points correctly. It'd be a good time to go over to electronic ignition. Spark plugs will be the next item to check. Have a good look once you've got them out and check the centre electrode to make sure that they're not badly worn. If they are, obviously they're going to have to be replaced and regapped. And don't forget, when you're replacing the spark plugs, you've got aluminium cylinder heads, so don't over-tighten them, as it's very easy to strip the threads. Accelerator cables, choke cables, should be checked to make sure they're not fraying. Carburetor breather pipes, make sure they're not perished and a nice tight fit. Have a look at the oil filler cap, make sure the cork seal there is OK and not damaged. And finally, pull the dipstick out and have a look at the felt seal underneath there. Because of the closed circuit breather system on the carburation, 
It's very important that there's no air leaks anywhere here. If there are, you won't be able to set the mixtures correctly on the carburettors. An easy way to check this is with the engine idling, just take the oil filler cap off. If the engine revs die, the closed circuit breather system is working correctly. If the engine revs stay as they are, then you've got a problem. You have to have a hunt round and try and find where the air leak is. Now we need to have a look inside the carburettors. So let's go across to the engine stand where it's much easier to see what we're doing. With the four screws removed from the top of the dash pot, we can remove the complete assembly. We can have a look at the diaphragm to make sure there's no rips or tears in it. Also, while it's apart, if you lose oil regularly from the dash pot, the reason for that is at the bottom here and the adjusting mechanism, there's an O-ring that goes brittle and perishes with age. Strip the assembly down, replace the O-ring. Whilst we're here, we can also check the vents. Now, if your car is mid-71 onwards, they redesigned the carburettors because of the hot start problems that they had. And they incorporated this little valve here, which you can see on this carb is working nicely, opening and shutting. If it isn't, that will give you hot start problems. So make sure it's lubricated and nice and free. Once we've drained the oil and removed the oil filter bowl, we now need to have a look inside it to make sure all its components are there. Inside the oil filter bowl assembly, we should have a rubber washer at the bottom, then the spring, then another washer, then the one-way valve assembly. And that's all held down by the clip. Once all that's in place, the oil filter can then go in. While we're on oil filters, no doubt you will all remember in the club magazine the saga of the cheap oil filters. Well, here we've got a, a cheap oil filter, which the ring has become detached, and a genuine unipart filter. And as you can see, they've molded in the spacer there, so there's no way that it can come out. If the oil filter bowl isn't assembled correctly, there's no point in having an oil filter in there at all, because it just won't be doing its job. Check the exhaust system for rust and blows on various joints. Also check the security of the mounting straps as it goes through the subframes. That can give you a nice healthy rattle. This car's got a stainless steel system on it, but give the clamps a good check. As you can see on this clamp, it's very rusty and that's going to need changing. Also check the rubber mountings to make sure they're not perished. Check the alternator and power steering belt to make sure they're tight, also the condition. Also a good idea to just take hold of one of the blades of the fan Give it a wiggle backwards and forwards, make sure there's no play in the viscous coupling itself. With the engine running, we can now start to carry out the engine tune. First of all, with the aid of a timing light, we can now set the ignition timing correctly. Just move the distributor around until we get the correct setting, which should be 12 to 14 degrees before top dead centre. While we're here, we can also check that the mechanical advance is working by bringing the engine revs up I'm watching the mark on the pulley wheel move across. We can also check the vacuum advance by just giving a little blip on the throttle and watching the, the pointer on the, on the pulley wheel again move across and then come back again. We'll do that again and see that moving across and then coming back. There we have the mechanical and the vacuum advance both working correctly here. Now we've set the ignition timing, we can turn our attention to the carburettors. First thing to check is that all the breather system that we talked about earlier is working. Just take the oil filler cap off, rev should drop. If they do, everything's fine. Next, disconnect one of the carb rod linkages, and we're going to balance the carbs. We use a, a test meter like this, which are readily available. First of all, this carb, noting the position of the the marker, then on this carb, and as we can see these are out, quite a way out, so we'd have to do some adjustments there to balance them up. Once we balance them up, reconnect the linkage. With the air filter back on and the element checked, and the hot air pipe back on, we can now try the old Thrupney bit test. That's for those of us that are old enough that can actually remember a Thrupney bit. When it comes to setting the carburetor mixtures, 
With the new MOT regulations, it's going to be virtually impossible to do it as a do-it-yourself task. You're going to have to take the car along to your local garage and get them to set the COs for you. Before we leave the engine, two items that we just talk about quickly. First one is the much discussed timing chains. The easy way to tell whether they're going to need attention or not is starting up from cold in the morning. Just have a listen as it starts and if there's a rattle for the first two or three seconds, that's the first sign that the chains are going to need replacing. What's actually happening there is that the, the oil feed to the tensioners takes a couple of seconds to get there before it tensions the chain. The next stage is when you're idling the engine, it's hot, and you've got a little rattle coming from the engine. Bring the engine revs up slightly and the rattle disappears. That's the stage where you've got to do something about it. Last thing is, is anti-freezing the engine. Very simple to do. Flush the system out by removing one of the hoses at the back, taking the top off the radiator, put a hose in there, and just run it through till clean water comes out the back. When you're topping up with antifreeze, we use six pints of antifreeze. Try not to use more than that. If you do, you can cause problems because antifreeze is thicker than water, therefore more difficult for the engine to circulate, can give you overheating problems. The next area of service is the gearbox. First of all, the oil levels. On the automatic, nice and simple, the dipstick tube is located right next to the engine at the back of the cylinder head. But on the manuals, however, it's not so easy. This car we're using is an automatic car. If it was a manual gearbox we had here, the filler plug and level plug is located on the side of the gearbox, just here. Check for oil leaks around the sump area, around the tail shaft, around the front of the gearbox, around the sump of the automatics. Being a Borgorna 65, where the dipstick goes in doesn't really cause too many problems. But on the earlier Borgorna 35 box, the banjo bolts tend to drip continuously. We've actually got in stock now a special washer that will cure that problem. Now let's turn our attention to the braking system. With the engine running, we'll first of all check the brake master cylinder. You can do this by pressing your foot quite hard on the brake pedal, then releasing a little bit, then pressing down again. Repeat this operation three or four times, and if the brake pedal slowly starts to sink away right down to the floor, then you've got a problem with the brake master cylinder, and you're going to need a new one. With the front brakes, we need to check the disc pad wear, make sure there's plenty of meat on them. We also need to check the disc itself to make sure that there's no heavy scoring or bad corrosion on it. You may find that the outside of the brake disc doesn't look too bad, but have a look on the inside. It's a bit difficult to see, but up behind the brake caliper there, you may get a nasty surprise. It's quite often that it's very badly corroded there. To give you a better example, we'll look at one on a bench. Compare this new brake disc with this old brake disc. It doesn't look too bad on the outside edge. But when we turn it over, we get a different story altogether. With the new brake disc, lots of area there, but the old rusted brake disc, about probably two-thirds braking area, that's all. Check the handbrake cable for frays as it comes out of the tube on the subframe mount. Then give the handbrake cable a few tugs and make sure that the handbrake mechanism in the drum itself isn't seized. On the rear brakes, first of all we'll take the drum off, we'll ch check the condition of the linings. If they start to look like these linings, then you've got problems. Certainly have their money's worth out of this one. Next, we check the wheel cylinder at the bottom to make sure it's not leaking. Just pull back the rubbers, see if any fluid comes out. These are nice and dry, so there's no problem. Next, we check that the wheel cylinder isn't seized. Very simply, by putting a screwdriver in there, lever it across. If the cylinder and shoe on the other side moves, everything's OK. And move it back again. That's all OK. Just ready for de-dusting now. That can go back together. While we're here, we'll look at the 
hydraulic lines. The flexible lines, all four of them, just give them a squeeze, make sure they're not starting to crack up. And also the metal lines, give those a scrape off to make sure that they're not starting to corrode and, and cause a problem in that department. The only thing that's left now is to replace the brake drums, flush out all the brake fluid and replace with new. Have a look at the top suspension mounts, remove the dust cover from the top, have a look inside, make sure it's not all rusted up or the rubber hasn't started to collapse. If you're getting a knocking noise when you're turning and steering from lock to lock when parking, it's a sure sign that that bearing in there has started to seize up. With the car in the air, check the gator on the front shock absorber isn't split or perished, then just lift it up and check that the shock absorber itself hasn't started to leak. Then have a look at the road spring. Make sure it's not bowed over to the back or to the front. If you get a peculiar graunching noise, it can be the spring actually touching the, the bodywork on the, on the inner turret there. So that's worth a look if you've got a peculiar noise on the front suspension. Front wheel bearing is quite easy to check. Hold the wheel top and bottom and give it a, a wiggle. See if there's any excess play in there that will need adjusting out. Now try and get someone to help you get them to hold the wheels front and back like that and give it a good wiggle backwards and forwards. While he's doing that, we can have a look around the other side and see if there's any movement in the swivel and track rod end. With someone giving the wheel a good wiggle for you, you can check the lower swivel here to make sure there isn't excessive play in it. If it looks like this one, that's definitely going to need changing. Next area would be the track rod end. Again, make sure there's no excessive movement in that. And also, have a feel of the, the ball joints on the steering rack there. See if there's any play in those. Then we need to go on and check the rubber bushes. We've got the inner track arm bush there, which will perish. Also, they'll move across, so you can end up with that arm actually touching the, the cross member there and rubbing metal against metal. Also, check the radius rod bushes here quite often that they're fitted back to front for some reason. I don't know why, but people do. Then we come forward onto the anti-roll bar, check the main anti-roll bar bush there, then follow the roll bar back, and we can see the anti-roll bar link, and again, check the top and bottom bushes there. Last thing to check for will be the rack mounting bushes, making sure they're not perished and there's big lumps of it hanging out of the sides of it. While you're under here, have a look around the steering rack for leaks. Have a look at the rack gator to make sure that's not split. And give it a squeeze to make sure it's not full of fluid. The power steering level is checked from the filler cap, which has a handy dipstick attached to it. And then just check the power steering hoses to make sure they're not perished or, or leaking. suspension, check the shock absorber, make sure it's not leaking, check the rubber bushes underneath to make sure they're not perished, then you'll need to lift up the hood and check the storage compartment area where the top mounts are, make sure that that's not cracked. Then back underneath we check the trailing arm bushes, make sure they're not perished, put a screwdriver in and just give it a press like that to make sure that there's no excessive movement on there. Check the rear subframe mounts. When the rubber comes away from the casing, it'll collapse and you'll lose this gap totally. That'll have to be changed in that case. If we go to this end of the subframe, check these two mounting bolts here on the diff nose extension. When they come loose, that will allow the nose of the diff to drop, it elongates those holes, and the rear wheels will start to tuck in at the top. When that happens, you'll have to replace the subframes. On the back axle assembly, check for oil leaks coming from the nose of the diff there, also from the output seals either side, and check the breather isn't choked. The breather's located on the back plate of the diff, right at the back on the top there. Then with the handbrake on, grab hold of the prop shaft and turn it backwards and forwards. Doing that, we'll check play in the universal joints, 
excessive backlash in the differential and also the drive shaft universal joints. If there's any play in those when you're doing this, that will become very obvious. And don't forget to check the diff nose extension. Have a close look inside there just to make sure it hasn't started to crack, as they do crack there. The only places you can use a grease gun on the stag is on the prop shaft front and rear UJ. You should find a little screw just about there on the crucifix. You can take that out, insert a grease nipple and pump fresh grease in. While you're underneath, you'll need to check for rust. The most common areas for serious rust are the front chassis outriggers, floor pan to sill, rear chassis outriggers, rear floor pan to sill, then coming backwards around the subframe mount area. Well, that just about finishes the service. But don't forget to check the battery and grease the terminals, of course. Check all the lights, all your instruments, the washers and wipers, heated rear screen. A little tip with the wipers, if, they, if they're a bit floppy and tend to hit the sides of the screen, try removing the arm, taking the wiper rack out, and turning the wheel box through 180 degrees, then put it all back together again. And hopefully you'll have got to a part of the wheel box that isn't badly worn. So finally check seat belts, tyre pressures and all those sort of things and really that sums it up. Well, I think now's the time to take it for a road test and go and have a well-earned pint.